Get ready for another Aces High Lifestyles, your VIP journey into the lives and loves of today's lucky winners who hit the jackpot in life's wheel of fortune. Welcome. Join us as we tour the homes and secret getaways of the rich and famous. Incredibly elegant and luxurious spaces filled with every amenity your heart could desire. Your host is Robin Leach. It's coastal luxury property and the price is a mere $20 million. The indoor kitchen is both inviting and perfectly fitted out, but so are the other ones outside. And as for the top floor parents retreat, Wow, it's got its own lounge room, dining room, study, bedroom, bathroom, and aquarium. The kids have their own wing, of course, but we're not done with luxury, not by a long shot. And there's the pool house to consider. There's masses of space here with kitchens and bars and a library, a ballroom. This is brilliant thinking. And outside, that pool is vast. And the tennis court, and this is another first, has an air-conditioned viewing gallery. And the glass here is shatterproof, but what about the soundproof gambling room? The house has a perimeter detection system. The moment you step foot on the property, lights come on, blinds go down, two-way voice is activated, the camera locks on you. This I love. A wine cellar that is also a panic room complete with bulletproof glass. Now that is thinking, am I right? That's right. Many of your favorite celebrities and Silicon Valley tech billionaires are quietly investing in end-of-the-world proof underground shelters. The establishment is digging into armored bunkers. The Survival Condo Project, a 15-story luxury apartment complex built in a Kansas former nuclear missile silo. And for $3 million, you could have had a full-floor private apartment. A recent report in the New Yorker magazine by Evan Osnos details how doomsday prepping for the super rich has taken hold among some of the wealthiest in America, from Silicon Valley to New York City. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. This niche real estate market has exploded in recent years and is now one of the hottest trends with the most powerful and wealthy people in the world. They're setting the plans in motion now. They're buying the bunkers. They're filling them with food. They're hiring the guards. A magnificent bomb shelter with enough food storage to last through a seven-year nuclear fallen, winter. And has become the habitation of devils. Equipped with the state-of-the-art air and water filtration system, powerful enough to filter radioactive chemical and biological contaminants. Don't worry about the commute. There's a helipad and a 1,000 metre private registered runway for light planes and parking for two planes and four cars. Unbelievable. Probably by driving or flying. Most of our clients have a uh, free plane. It has become the habitation of devils they and the hold of every They also purchased extended range armor vehicles. These people have uh, vehicles that have a range of uh, up to 2,500 miles without having to stop for fuel and they're armored and they're bulletproof. So if it takes them two days to drive and they have to stop, they can... Uh, it has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. Hollywood and others who believe America's done. Finally, the CEO of a brokerage house explained that he'd nearly completed building his own underground bunker system and asked, how do I maintain authority over my security force after the event? The event, that was their euphemism for the environmental collapse, social unrest, a nuclear explosion, unstoppable virus, or Mr. Robot hack that takes everything down. And the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. But why are so many of the wealthy and powerful choosing now to prepare all at the same time? Could there be something they know that the masses don't?
Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Hateful bird. Hateful bird. History has many secrets. The official story is never the whole story. Our nation's great seal is an unfinished pyramid. Above floats the symbol of the esoteric orders, the radiant triangle with its all-seeing eye. The eye of the falcon god Horus. Was it the Society of the Unknown Philosophers who sealed the new nation with the ancient and eternal emblem? The writings of the 33rd degree Freemason, Manly P. Hall, are the leading authority on the esoteric and occult history of America. Concerning America's Great Seal, Manly P. Hall wrote, quote, European mysticism was not dead at the time the United States of America was founded. The hand of the mysteries controlled in the establishment of the new government for the signature of the mysteries may still be seen on the great seal of the United States of America. Careful analysis of the seal discloses a mass of occult and Masonic symbols, chief among them the so-called American Eagle. The American Eagle upon the Great Seal is but a conventionalized phoenix. Not only were many of the founders of the United States government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The Great Seal is the signature of this exalted body unseen and for the most part unknown and the unfinished pyramid upon its reverse side is a trestle board setting forth symbolically the task to the accomplishment of which the united states government was dedicated from the day of its inception end quote since ancient egypt the phoenix whether real or mythological has been an enduring symbol of immortality rebirth order out of chaos and triumph over death. The phoenix has been depicted in a wide variety of ways throughout many cultures and time periods, but all of these legends seem to share the central characteristics which make the phoenix legend powerful and resilient, most notable, the longevity of the bird. It is said to have a lifespan of 600 to 1,000 years. The phoenix is most famous for the spectacular way in which it dies and is reborn through a process of spontaneous combustion which incubates its egg and from its ashes a new phoenix is reborn. When the time came to select an appropriate emblem for the great seal of the United States of America, several designs were submitted. These are described by Galliard Hunt in The History of the Seal of the United States published in Washington, D.C. in 1909. Most of the designs originally submitted had the phoenix bird on its nest of flames as the central motif. Is a phoenix that burst into flame when it is time for them to die, and then they are reborn from the ashes? Welcome to the United Nations Security Council. The Security Council is the most significant part of the UN. The Security Council is made up of 15 different countries. They sit here around this circular table. The Security Council is called to order. The painting by Per Krog signifies a new beginning. It's about the phoenix rising out of the ashes. Notice the giant mural that towers over the Security Council room. The central focus of the UN mural is the phoenix bird that has risen. The phoenix bird is a symbol of Lucifer, 
Egyptians believed that the phoenix symbolized a god who rose to heaven in the form of a morning star like Lucifer after his fire immolation of death and rebirth. Notice that the phoenix bird is not standing above his own ashes. He is standing above his old skin. Like a snake, he has shed his old skin and is revealing himself as God at the center of the mural. At the top left, there is a church steeple without a cross. The missing cross symbolizes the death of Christianity. Below, a woman receives the rays of the sun god while the man in front of her plays Pan's flute. To their right are two pyramid symbols and people joined together by a long blue serpent-like cloth. Below the risen phoenix, a sword is driven through a dragon beast. This represents the killing of old beliefs and religions that depicted Lucifer as a beast. The New World religion worships him as beautiful. In this post-apocalyptic mural, the military man standing on the tail of the beast represents worldwide military power. He tips his helmet to the elite, who are climbing out from underground cities where they safely hid from the apocalypse. Armed security patrol the entrance to a doomsday bunker that's reserved for the wealthy elite, and sales are booming. These 16,000 pound doors lock you inside. We're heading deep below the surface of the earth into an underground bunker like no other. We are in a typical full floor residential unit. And even though we are more than 100 feet underground right now, you can see that it's certainly not a claustrophobic area. Twelve luxurious condos exist here with fireplaces, high-end appliances, jacuzzis, even windows. Yes, windows. High-definition TVs broadcast a live feed of the outside world right into your living room. The price tag for this three-bedroom, two-bath condo, $2.3 million. Well, as the sign says, welcome to the beach. And look at this. It's a swimming pool with a slide and waterfall. D.C. officials flock to doomsday camps. What do they know that we don't know? Most of the big Hollywood producers were evacuating to New Zealand or Tasmania. Behind the phoenix, the ghostly figures of the walking dead are stepping into a void. They symbolize depopulation. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. On the right panel, the pale horse from the book of Revelation is the bringer of death to humanity through weapons, hunger, and disease. The man is releasing him. The chained black man represents slavery, while the top panel of the mural shows a technologically advanced white race. Donald Trump signs an unprecedented bill commemorating the first Negro slaves to arrive on the shores of America in 1619. I just want to take a mo few moments to thank the House for the, the work they did recently on H.R. 1242. And I want to urge the Senate to take action on this bill as well. I saw rise in support of it. Uh, it's 1242. It's titled 400 Years of African American History Commission Act. Uh, thank you and good morning. I'm so thrilled to work together on this very important bill, the 400 Years of African American History Commission Act. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. The Order of the Phoenix. In the main oval panel above the phoenix bird, a woman is holding flowers. She is the bride in a wedding ceremony. Who are these newlyweds that are kneeling submissively beneath the serpent in the overhead tree? The serpent in human form is tempting the little girl Eve who accepts the apple. On the right side of the top panel, a reptilian green creature with scaly skin is dancing with a naked woman while musicians entertain him. The general message of the UN's Phoenix Rising mural is that humanity is stepping into a new Luciferic reality. Beneath this disturbingly prophetic mural, world leaders make global decisions that affect the lives of nearly 7 billion people. This is Phoenix. She's considered an avian ambassador, a link between the world of the wild eagle and our own. 
a very charismatic bird, a creature worthy of being America's national symbol. What's hard for most people to grasp is that our elected government leaders are involved in an apocalyptic scheme to enslave the masses under a world government dictatorship. It seems many Hollywood spellcasters are aware of the global secret societies and their Phoenix conspiracy. As we get closer to the event, the more TV and movies reveal their agenda. But remember, like any demon, before they come in, you must open the door and predictive programming is how they knock and reveal themselves to you. Let's decode Hollywood's apocalyptic prophecies hidden in plain sight. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. The Amazon original series, American Gods, reveals the pagan roots of many American legends, holidays, and traditions. These customs lurk beneath the surface of a thinly veiled Christian veneer. Let me tell you a story of what's waiting for you on the show. The FX original American Horror Story Apocalypse. This series continues to incorporate the real life historical figure of Madame Delphine LaLaurie as a reoccurring character on the show. The real LaLaurie was an 1800s New Orleans witch who tortured, mutilated, and murdered her slaves in the most gruesome ways imaginable. The FX show is making a clear connection between the coming apocalypse and the demonic spirits that possess Madame Delphine LaLaurie to commit these hideous crimes. You arrive in America! Land of opportunity, milk and honey, and guess what? Forced labor was used to erect Egyptian-style obelisks, monuments, and landmarks built in relation to the stars, all placed in such a way to create a map covered with geometric patterns, sigils used in mask incantations, casting binding spells on the uninitiated unsuspecting inhabitants of the land. New reports about the opioid crisis in America. Good morning, America. Only on ABC's Good Morning America. The suicide rate is at an all-time high. Ready for this trailblazing 11-year-old drag kid who RuPaul is calling the future. His bravery is inspiring so many. We're going to talk to him in just a moment, but first, let's take a look at his amazing story. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. I am Desmond. I'm 11 years old, and I like pizza, trains, and drinking root beers and that's caffeine free. I also do drag, and I love to put on makeup, dresses, and wigs, and of course, jewelry if necessary. And the hold of every foul spirit. We miss the past. They dream of tomorrow. We may thrust them forward into the future, but the course will always be theirs to choose. Celine wants all kids to find themselves, not just her own. And she hopes her partnership with Nu Nu will help. The clothes in her new line are gender neutral. This clothing line is heavily promoted in America, although the company is based out of Tel Aviv, Israel. Let them tell you what they feel like. New 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 has been around for years. Its founders created the fashion line out of necessity when they couldn't find clothing for their own kids. Fashion has the power to shape people's minds. We're at Sunny New New trying to shape the future of all human beings by saying, find your own individuality. We bring a new order. In a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Uh, as a concept, 
into the world. Into the world. Yeah, the Drag Queen Storytelling Time program intended to celebrate individuality. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Go to sleep, go to sleep. Close your big bloodshot eyes. You're the dope and you're the light. And I hope you don't wake up. A twirly, talented boy. This is Adult Swim's animated show, Off the Air. I mean, first of all, I'm coming down here because we don't do that. The the the, uh, the transgender and all that. We, you know, we don't do that. I understand. I don't need and, that. He's and I, I, I don't appreciate you encouraging him to put on no dress for the second day, too. I don't appreciate that. And don't think this is going away. I'm going further with this. Okay. You can go down and talk no, to No, I'm not done talking to you. I'm letting you know the next time that you put any kid in a dress, we're going to make you go viral. Okay. You need to go talk to my director. Because I, as a teacher... No, I mean, you know I got an issue with you about that. I'm not playing with you. I'm sorry that you feel that way. Yeah, I'm sorry that you feel that way. But you should have called me before you made the decision to put my grandson in a dress. Okay, you can speak to me. No, I'm speaking to you. I wouldn't be up here if you wouldn't put my grandson in no dress. You all get to be slaves. When the United States was founded, the architecture was designed in alignment with the rising of the star Sirius in the East. The tobacco your grandkids are gonna farm for free. July 4th, Independence Day, is the day when the sun is in conjunction with the dog star Sirius, the star of Isis. Here is astronaut Buzz Aldrin. Collins in Columbia. 33rd degree Mason on the moon holding the flag of the Supreme Council which he later brought back to Earth the ankle has landed. and gave to the Supreme Commander of the House of the Temple. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. That's the story in America! And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. The nature of the Great Seal is so mysterious that some believe that it came from a supernatural force. Rising like a phoenix out of an old ashen earth, Caduceus stands upon a golden new orb of enlightened energy. Around her swirl a whirlwind created by twin serpents that are waiting to be reunited at the world's ending cycle. America, the majestic and soaring eagle, has been hiding a highly combustible and flammable secret. The true hidden nature of the so-called American eagle is really that of the phoenix, a infernal symbol handed down from an unseen realm through the secret occult brotherhoods in Europe. During the opening and closing ceremony of the 2012 Olympics in London, the Phoenix Conspiracy and its architects were on full display. All symbols have their origin in something tangible, and the phoenix is one sign of the secret orders of the ancient world and of the initiate of those orders. Gems. 
James Bond, 007. For it was common to refer to one who had been accepted into the temples as a man twice born or reborn. Mr. Bond, your majesty. <clears throat> now the most powerful dynasty that enjoyed direct descent was the Tudor dynasty of England. The word Tudor comes from the word tutor, meaning the teachers, that is, the educated ones, those with knowledge. The leader of the Tudor dynasty during this period was called the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth Tudor, Elizabeth I, literally, she who must be obeyed. And as such, she employed Sir John Dee. Dr. John Dee is the creator of Enochian magic, or the initiated ones. So Enochian magic is nothing more than the magic of the high ones, the magic of the initiated ones. And through Enochian magic, John Dee believed he could talk to the angels. John Dee was one of the most brilliant thinkers of the 16th century. Dee became a key figure in the Elizabethan court and one of Queen Elizabeth's most trusted advisors. A true Renaissance man, he was at the forefront of scientific and philosophical thought in one of the great ages of learning and discovery. But all this was not enough. In his insatiable quest for knowledge, Dee strayed into the forbidden world of the occult. I seek the treasure of heavenly wisdom and knowledge. So why do they condemn me as a companion of hellhounds and a conjurer of wicked and damned spirits? He was trying to find the very essence of life. He was trying to find the secrets of the universe. Angel magic. Whatever Dee said was black magic. And for John Dee, that meant communing with angels, communing with demons, risking his soul. He risked everything in his quest, and his diaries record how ultimately he became the instrument of forces beyond his control. Using his wealth of occult knowledge in astrology, John Dee began predicting timeline events. He even started making predictions for when these major events would occur, such as the death of Queen Mary of England. When Queen Mary heard about his prediction and his practices, he was thrown into prison for three years for practicing black magic. When Queen Mary died in 1558, on the very day John Dee had predicted using his astrology, Queen Elizabeth I, her half-sister, rose to power and immediately freed John from prison, appointing him her top advisor in council. Dee found fame and favor under Elizabeth, and she dubbed him my noble intelligentsia, giving him license to work in complete freedom. She gave official sanction to Dee, pretty much declaring that anything he did was white magic, divine magic, a form of science, and putting the royal seal on that. Basically, Dee was in love with Elizabeth, as a lot of her courtiers were, but she had a strong link to him too. She clearly saw him as somebody who she could trust. He was convinced there were hidden forces that govern the way the physical world works. But as the years passed, he began to despair of ever finding them. For 40 years continually, with great pain, care and cost, I have sought the best knowledge that man might attain in the world. I have found that neither any man living or book was able to teach me those truths I desired and longed for. Dee has looked into mathematics, he's looked into astrology and astronomy, he's, he's absorbed all these strands, but it still hasn't given him the thing that he wants. He now is prepared to go to the next step, which is to go deep into the occult, into hidden knowledge, in order to try to find these secrets. Dee was at the point of giving up his quest when he made the discovery that changed the course of his life. The Steganographia is an infamous black magic manuscript written in the 15th century. The book was written in a coded language that contained many barbarous and strange names of spirits. It was believed that these spirits were the key to a reservoir of hidden knowledge. These attempts at scrying yielded nothing until a man with a notorious reputation as a black magician appeared at Mortlake. His name was Edward Kelly. Kelly was a strange, difficult, fractious, troublesome character. I mean, as soon as he came into Dee's life, 
D became involved in something that was way beyond his control. If the ritual worked correctly, then entities would be summoned, at which point him and D would interrogate whatever it appeared to them. D was excited and intrigued by Kelly's incredible visions. He was desperate to find out what and who these entities were. Suddenly, this extraordinary cast of angelic characters erupted from the crystal ball that he used, from sort of coquettish young maids to these great giants with suns blazing from their eyes. <laughs> Dee constantly struggled with the angels. I mean, he was constantly questioning whether or not he should believe them. He was questioning whether or not they were angels or whether, in fact, they were demons disguised as angels. There are entities whose speech was so apocalyptic, so cold and beautiful and terrifying, that even to modern ears, this is scary stuff. In his quest for knowledge, Dee tapped into the powers of the beyond, hoping to learn secrets from the spirit realm. He practiced much of his craft in secret as an active member of the Rosicrucians in England. Some even credit Dee with founding the modern Rosicrucian movement. Amok. A for ancient. Traditionally speaking, the Rosicrucian order dates back to the mystery schools of ancient Egypt. This is the headquarters of the modern Rosicrucian order. The Rosicrucian order with its modern headquarters in San Jose, California, has for centuries been linked to Freemasonry. Rosicrucian orders within the Masons and the Illuminati. Well, you have to understand that Freemasonry is simply the modern day manifestation of the ancient mystery of religions. The ideas of Masonry were, have been around literally for thousands of years. And of course, Rosicrucianism uh, was simply a, a forerunner of modern day Masonry. Like Masonry, the Rosicrucians traced their religion to the mysteries of ancient Egypt. This country was founded by real Rosicrucians, not the Rosicrucians you see out there today. Their power base in San Jose centers around an Egyptian museum. When one follows the Rosicrucian trail, John Dee was a very, very key influence in the historical Rosicrucians, and some say even the, you know, the founder of it, the first president of it. There are chapters of the Rosicrucians studying every place across America where they recruit people into the Rosicrucian order. People have no idea that uh, these people are even here. Nevertheless, the Rosicrucians are said to be the first of the secret orders to have opened a door in the New World. The very first that we know of a cult beachhead in America was Rosicrucian. Their visit the Ephrata Cloister, it's called, in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And it's where the original Rosicrucian community built its, its headquarters, right, right on the east coast of the United States. And that was in the 1600s. Now, Sir John Dee worked closely with his confederates all over the globe. They employed the fraternity structure to ensure that only the chosen would be exposed to the real occult history of the world and to their role as the future leaders and thinkers overworld and underworld figures, educated and funded to adroitly lead the rest of mankind down whatever roads became necessary. In the tarot cards, for instance, the devil card is number 15. What they wanted has had the severest consequences for the future of mankind. The macrobes basically told him that what they wanted was blood. Blood has some very specific occult properties, and that's what the macrobes wanted. And John Dee, his reply was, how much do you want and when do you want it? Whatever it takes. This thing is already going to take us hundreds of years. Whatever you need for that information, you will get it. And so John Dee literally put the whole of the human race up in a great black magic mass, a great right to his overlords, the oversouls that were asking him for payment, literally, in blood. Since the first day of the first effusion of blood, it has never ceased to flow. Mankind has always believed in three things with an unconquerable faith. 
that the effusion of blood is necessary, that there is a manner of shedding blood which is purifying. History clearly attests these truths. It presents to us the narrative of cruel acts, boiling people in oil, of the overflow and destruction of famous cities, murdering entire cities, of atrocious murders committed, of pure victims offered on blood-stained altars, sacrifice more than 10,000, of brothers warring against brothers, of the rich oppressing the poor. They see you as animals until the earth appears to us like an immense sea of blood, the royals drink blood, which neither the piercing breath of the winds can dry up, nor the scorching rays of the sun can absorb. The death toll is awesome. Torture dungeons, mass executions, the total of human mass lives raping, lost is 18 million 200,000 predators against their own, 16 million 300,000 civilians. Sex slavery, for a grand total, including women and children. 4 million deaths for 20 million. You see, they're obsessed with blood. Communing with angelic beings that provide scientific knowledge was a familiar practice. Now, there was a, a, a pretty, uh, very brief and shady dividing line between what they called scientific knowledge and what we might call outright witchcraft. The secret societies of the Elizabethan era were in danger not for the knowledge they possessed, but how they obtained it through occult practices of summoning spirits and conjuring demons. They were, nevertheless, determined to continue for the cause of science and learning. Dr. John Dee led the way in this arena. His method became known as angel magic because of his contact with spirits that Dee believed were sometimes good and sometimes evil. During the course of what became known as the angelic conversations, 70 different spirits would appear to Kelly. Some appeared human, others monstrous and demonic. They were angels they recognized from ancient versions of the Bible. But many of the spirits, like the beautiful coquettish maiden Medimi, were mysterious and unheard of. Dee fervently recorded every last detail of the scrying sessions in his diary. Dee was working in a world where it wasn't magic that he was doing, it was a science of angels. This is somebody approaching this unearthly territory with incredible scientific method. And not only were the, were the angels sort of interesting, they were delivering fantastic material. They seemed to be delivering some sort of coded message that would reveal the secrets of the universe. Dee was now convinced that he was close to fulfilling his ultimate ambition, and the angelic conversations took over his life and work. Mortlake would never be the same again. Dee's young wife, Jane, detested Kelly. She believed that he was evil and that the angelic conversations would lead them to ruin. Angel magic's an odd one. It is, uh, despite wearing these ostentatious trappings of piety, at core black magic. In some ways, it's difficult to think of anything more blasphemous than trying to get the angels of the Lord to do your bidding. And the angelic messages were delivered with even greater intensity. It seemed to Dee that his unshakable faith in the angels was about to be rewarded. They are told that there's something, a powerful message is going to be dictated to them. The first angel begins to talk to them about a, a lost book of Enoch, which is the language of the angels, the original language spoken by Adam before the fall. The angel told us, I will open to thee the secrets of nature and the riches of the world. Many thousand secrets in which you are still yet but children. Letter by letter, the dictation of the Enochian language began. After months of scrying and hundreds of hours looking into the crystal ball, the angels revealed what appeared to be a completely new language. To suppose that this is an invented language, invented by Kelly, you would have to suppose that Kelly was some sort of creative and linguistic genius 
who was able to spontaneously invent a functional working language complete with grammar and vocabulary, and not only invent it, but invent it backwards. In a diary entry of June 8, 1584, Dee records a startling account. When the angels tried to persuade him that Jesus was not God, and that no prayers ought to be made to him. They further claimed that sin did not really exist, and that man's soul simply moves from one body to another, in what sounds like reincarnation. Upon hearing this, Kelly was apparently distraught and believed they had contacted evil spirits. Nevertheless, the angels provided Dr. D with gifts of knowledge. D was the first to apply Euclidean geometry to navigation. He built the instruments for and trained the first great navigators. He is credited with coining the word Britannia or Britain and his influence laid the foundation for what would become the British Empire. He made his own maps and is said to have charted the northeast and northwest passages in his attempts to increase the wealth of England by gaining access to the New World. His knowledge of navigation helped spearhead England's great age of exploration and discovery. He even coined the expression, the British Empire. He provided the clearinghouse at Mortlake for all the latest navigational information, which formed the basis of the great age of exploration for, for English mariners across the Atlantic to the New World. When the new queen took the throne, it marked the beginning of an unprecedented era in English history. During this time, the language of the New World would be transformed ancient knowledge would unfold and the course of the philosophic empire would be established. The modern world would be changed forever, largely because of Queen Elizabeth I. Slavery was a powerful engine that drove the British economy. It allowed Britain's slave owners to amass extraordinary personal wealth. Few people know that John Dee was the original Agent 007 in Her Majesty's Secret Service. And if you study the symbol for MI5, you'll notice that it has a triangular pyramidical shape with the crown of the queen, and it has a eye, the Enochian eye, at the northern apex. Ian Fleming got the idea for his designation 007 for James Bond from the fact that that was how John Dee would sign his correspondence when he was overseas working as a spy for Queen Elizabeth. He would always sign his name 007. And that's where the concept came in for James Bond. Because he was, James Bond was originally intended to be kind of a modern day Dr. John Dee. The opening and closing ceremonies for the 2012 Olympics in London were extremely significant to the occult world. Queen Elizabeth II and Daniel Craig came together to pay homage to the founders of the Rosicrucian and Freemason orders. And when John Dee used to go on occasion to visit the royal houses of other countries, and when he'd write back to his mistress, she who must be obeyed, Elizabeth I, he'd always sign at the bottom of his documents, 007. That was the sigil of the head of the MI5 of those days. And of course, that is later picked up and the stories of Ian Fleming. So the 007, the original, way back at the time of the Tudor dynasty, was Sir John Dee, master occultist. Surrounded by illuminated pyramids, the Queen and James Bond, 007. James Bond epic, starring Daniel Craig and Her Majesty the Queen. The careful conservation treatment of these three paintings has allowed us to learn really quite a lot more about the way they were painted um, and what they might well have meant to their first audiences. So with this picture, the so-called Phoenix portrait of Elizabeth I, 
the really very painstaking conservation treatment has brought the picture back to life, revealing original details that have been concealed for centuries. Surrounded by illuminated pyramids, the Queen and James Bond 007 honor and venerate the flaming phoenix while paying homage to Queen Elizabeth I and Dr. John Dee, the mother and father of European and American sorcery. In the modern world, Dee was the role model for J.K. Rowling's Albus Dumbledore in the Harry Potter books. Witchcraft and wizardry. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. a phoenix, Harry. They burst into flame when it is time for them to die, and then they are reborn from the ashes. America, the majestic and soaring eagle, has been hiding a highly combustible and flammable secret. The true nature of the so-called American eagle is really that of the phoenix, an infernal symbol handed down from an unseen realm through the secret occult brotherhoods in Europe, which not only financed the 13 colonies, but funded and guided the Revolutionary War. To the initiates, the eagle is merely a disguise, created to make the public feel safe so they do not fear the fiery destiny of this nation. New Egypt, Mystery Babylon, the last manifestation of the great whore of Babylon. Even as Sir Francis Bacon and his contemporary, Dr. John Dee, were said to be in contact with the spirit realm, there are those who believe that it is this dimension that has been guiding the course of America and the so-called evolution of the dollar bill. This image shows what appears to be a wizened old man passing a lamp in the dead of night to a younger man in Elizabethan clothing. Baconians believe this old world engraving represents Dr. John Dee passing the lamp of esoteric knowledge and wisdom to his successor, Francis Bacon. Both Bacon and Dee were men of science dedicated to the advancement of learning. Both men were members of the Rosicrucian Society of which Bacon would become the chief. Like Bacon, John Dee believed that America was indeed the lost continent of Atlantis. But where did he get this idea? Was it given to him by his angels? And did he pass this concept on to Francis Bacon? This 1910 Newfoundland stamp commemorates Bacon's early influence. It reads, Lord Bacon, the guiding spirit in the colonization scheme. I know that Rosicrucianism today holds Bacon in highest esteem as an active transmitter of the secrets. Uh, he's, he's a, a demigod uh, in Rosicrucianism. But Bacon's influence was not confined to Rosicrucianism. He is considered by some to have been the first to formalize the mystery teachings into a system now recognized as modern masonry. This international society would also come to the New World. And while Bacon's Rosicrucians would maintain a position of careful anonymity, the order of masonry would stretch its hands in America to the very heights of power. Nowhere is the Masonic presence more clearly seen than in the design of America's capital city, Washington, D.C. Yes, Washington, D.C. is completely 
uh, uh, based on, uh, on Masonic architecture. The whole architecture is laid out in an occult matter with Masonic symbology. Every major building in, the, in Washington, D.C. has a Masonic placard. I mean, the, the Masons have permeated and the other secret societies have permeated our society since the very beginning. If you either look at the map of Washington, D.C. or try and drive in Washington, D.C., you think it must have been designed by a nutcase. But actually, it was designed by a Freemason, a French Freemason named L'Enfant. Uh, I think Pierre Charles L'Enfant was his name. And, and it's full of esoteric symbolism. Ovison writes that, like the pyramids of Egypt, the entire city was built in alignment with the stars and suggest that the hidden purpose for the Masonic rituals is that America might be empowered by the gods of the ancient world. Can this be the reason for the pagan god and goddess images that have come to represent America? Tradition often claims that America was founded as a Christian nation only. But if this is the case, why are its symbols those of the pagan religions rather than images of Christ, the apostles, and stories from the Bible? The Washington Monument is an obvious phallic symbol. The Vesica Pisces paths surrounding the obelisk suggest female. Taken together, the symbols represent the joining of Osiris and Isis and the conception of the sun god Horus. But take a look at what is above the elevator that goes up the shaft of the Washington Monument. Right above the elevator doors, there is a bronze sculpture of George Washington, sculpted by French Freemason Houdon, and above that is the winged disk of Horus. What in the world does this Egyptian solar symbol have to do with America? It's a clue to the secret meaning of the obelisk in the most public of places, but how many actually see it and understand? The dimensions of the monument are all sixes and fives. What an amazing coincidence that 6,660 inches equals 555 feet. We'll decipher the meaning of sixes and fives in Egypt. Its enchanted stone walls have stood strong through the ages. There's no one, there's no one up here. Yeah. Uh, this elevator will slow down considerably and the lights will go out. And you'll be able to look out and see some of our commemorative stones. I'll give it in honor of George Washington. So here's the first slowdown. Yeah, you can, you can go up and look. Just don't lean on the, on, on, uh, on the glass. But you, can, you can kind of look out there. Oh, see, all 50 amazing. states are represented, uh, numerous countries, cities, civic groups, Masonic lodges, uh, the Vatican sent a stone. It was Manley Hall who influenced the placement of 72 stones on the Great Pyramid of the Dollar Bill. Since the number 72 is said to be a magical number in the occult. It was also Hall who taught that the American Eagle was a cleverly disguised phoenix bird. In his writings, he documents this account from the first century AD. There is a certain bird which is called a phoenix, and when the time of its dissolution draws near that it must die, it builds itself a nest. Could this somehow be a veiled reference to the secret destiny of America? Many researchers have come to believe that the plan of these Luciferian societies is that, like the Phoenix of old, the America that we know will ultimately be destroyed and that from her ashes will be born a new world order. A series of original stories by writer J.K. Rowling. Far across the oceans, the official story is never the whole story. History has many secrets. J.K. Rowling herself, who is the author, says that she took more than a third of the research and the content of these so-called fantasy books from occult research. So she has drawn from history, she has drawn from mythology, she admits that she has drawn from the religions of uh, Celtic, Druidic, Satanic, Wiccan, Pagan roots and written them into her fiction books. Weathering powerful storms, look beyond the surface and you 
you will find another world. A secret world where magic is real. Running parallel to our own. Witchcraft and wizardry. And the magical congress of the United States of America. These aren't myths you thought you knew. Magic in North America. Everything you think you know is about to change. When you hear about slavery for 400 years, for 400 years? That sounds like a choice. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. When you hear about slavery for 400 years, for 400 years, that sounds like a choice. A choice. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. That sounds like a choice. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenedst not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder. In front of me is the Xander Van Bible Dictionary. And I discovered in this dictionary the definition of Ham and who his descendants are. And it says, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of the eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites, Genesis 10, 6-20. But who else are the real Shemites? Torah-keeping Jews worldwide that are the true Shemites, just like the Yemenite Jews and the black African Shemites. And I most probably shouldn't go here, but I will anyway. You see, after the destruction of the temple, yes, many of the Jews, the poor Jews, remained in the land. But there was a migration as well of the more affluent Jews to Yemen, and to other parts of Africa, other parts of Africa. You see, the black African Shemites were actually then taken away in slave ships 
Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68. Samuel Moetti is president of the Lemba Cultural Association. Pleasure. So, I'll be honest, I, I came into this village and the first word I heard was shalom, yes. a Hebrew word. Yes. How is that possible? How is it that the Lemba is speaking Hebrew? The Lembas are the original Hebrews and they were scattered, as you know, and they crossed into Africa. So they were scattered all over. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods. So the Lembas claim to be descendants of ancient Israelites? Not claim. They are. They are. They are. They are. Okay. It sounds to me like the Lemba have a, a unique culture surrounded by others who do not practice the same way. That is correct. These people, who to the casual observer look just like the other African communities they live among, actually do have DNA passed down from Middle Eastern forefathers. This proves that when it comes to race, looks really can be deceiving. So the genetic testing actually proved to the doubters what you and your forefathers have been saying for generations. That must be exciting news. It is. I'll be honest, I hadn't heard of the Lemba. I knew very little about the people. But having spent time making the journey from Jerusalem down through Zimbabwe, having spent time here at this festival, seeing what your people are all about, I can only sum it up in one word, and it's shalom. Shalom. We've seen how science has backed up the claims of the Lemba in the face of years of doubt and prejudice. The archaeological clues, the DNA evidence, and the Lemba's own oral history add up to a very convincing argument. When we join the priesthood together as Joseph's coat, we're victorious. Then we're victorious over the New World Order slavers, their Luciferic, Levitical perversion. You see, they're obsessed with blood. They're obsessed with their own blood and they're obsessed with your blood, but they're not obsessed with Yahusha's blood. Throughout the Bible, the olive tree is used to represent not only the nation of Israel, but the tribe of Judah. Although to the vast majority of Americans, the olive branch in the hand of the eagle is a symbol of peace, but to the initiates of the occult brotherhoods, the olive branch in the claw of the phoenix is none other than the lost tribe of Judah. The Luciferians plan to use America and this olive branch to create a phoenix nest so it may be consumed by feathers of flame as a burnt offering. They believe that their Antichrist beast will rise from the ashes, but the Most High Yahuwah and His Son Yahshua HaMashiach have other plans. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. What the heck? I mean, what do we have to lose? You know, like, life is short. I'm just a normal person, of course. I'm a nobody, but I love Jesus. And um, in 2016, God gave me just a burden to pray. And I just sensed like we all did, that things were looking dire. And I just began to cry out to God in a simple prayer, like, what are you doing? I just would say, what are you doing, God? I would wake up in the middle of the night at three or four in the morning for like four or five nights in a row. After about the fourth or fifth night, I just would, I just got up. And I was like, I might as well get up and pray and read the Bible, you know. And I 
just prayed, God, who should I vote for? That was it. And I just waited. And in the stillness of my soul, quieting my mind and quieting my soul and just waiting on the Lord, I got a picture in my mind and I'm very, very sane. I'm, if you don't believe or whatever in the supernatural or God's ability to communicate with his people through his rhema word, then I, I, you know, I would, I don't know how to help out. I'm just going to share what happened to me. So I just received what I would call visions or like pictures in my mind. God showed me a vision about a great awakening. And um, so I'm going to share about the great awakening. I saw one of those evenings when I was in prayer, just praying for the United States, praying for the healing of our nation. I just prayed for healing. So God showed me <laughs> that um, when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, I saw a cloud cover the nation especially on the eastern half of the United States. I don't know what that means. And the eastern half of the United States mostly was covered. Um, maybe, I don't know why, I'm not gonna read into it. Um, it was covered in, a, in like a cloud, and the cloud was low and it was a fog. It was a fog of grief and it was a sleepy, sleepy like fog that caused people to fall asleep in the spirit. And it happened in 1968 when he was shot and killed. Then I saw another just next scene, I guess, of um, a lot of black people individually walking into their front door of their homes and I saw people walking upstairs into like you know their apartment or brown house you know those brownstone brownstones those kinds of buildings and I saw like like an individual woman let's say walking upstairs opening her door going in shutting the door and then going into her room going into her room and getting into bed putting the covers on falling asleep and then I would see another person, you know, walking up like a man, walking down the sidewalk, turning into his yard, opening the door of his house, going in, falling asleep, going to bed, falling asleep. And so I just saw several individual people, a few of them were like white or another national, like skin color, but most people were black. And um, God just showed me that those, um, the movement that Martin Luther King Jr. represented when he died, people were so overcome with grief and just hopelessness. And just now what do we do? Now what? And they went home and they were so consumed by grief and hopelessness and sadness that they all went home shut the door and went to bed and went to sleep because they couldn't handle the pain anymore. This was a nation thing. This was like a generation thing. But then I was like, oh, I wonder what year, I didn't think about it. I wonder what year Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. So I looked it up after God showed me this vision, 1968. And then I was like, whoa. And then the Lord showed me a cloud, I mean a, a wind, that God was like <sighs> breathing a big breath of wind and it was blowing away the cloud. God's wind was blowing off this fog 
and he was waking everybody up and they were getting up, they were getting out of their beds and they were waking up and they were coming out of their homes and they were awake again and God showed me just this understanding. I immediately understood and had a knowledge that 50 represents the year of Jubilee in the Hebrew culture. Also, it is literally a year of Jubilee right now in 2018 in the Hebraic calendar year 5778. We are in a Jubilee year. You can think about Jerusalem. Obviously, it's the 50th anniversary of Jerusalem being um, part of Israel since 1968. And this year, 2018, is the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s death. And I am seeing literally all around me um, on like Twitter and on the news and um, like YouTube and every like Kanye West and people are thinking Con Candace Owens and Jordan Peterson and the awakening is literally happening. Though I agree with her that the so-called African Americans are in the midst of a great awakening, we are not waking from the coma of the Democratic Party just to slumber in the vegetative state of the Republican Party. With their Bohemian Grove Luciferian rituals and neocon false flags to justify Patriot Acts. This is a true awakening, awakening to our true identity as the children of Israel and to our true King, Yahshua HaMashiach, King of Kings, Son of the Most High Yahuwah, Creator of the Universe. During the 1800s, many documents and treaties were signed by Native Americans and African Americans with an X. In the 1960s, many African Americans replaced their last name with an X, which signifies unknown. These are the X-Men. The civil rights movement of 1950s and 60s America inspired Stan Lee to weave some social commentary into X-Men. X-Men Dark Phoenix is still going to come out on June 7th, 2019. Mr. President, what did you mean by calm before the storm yesterday? You'll find out. The comment especially ominous is... U.S. defense officials say this is the real deal. Russia test firing its new high-speed hypersonic missile, a missile that the U.S. military currently cannot defend against. Russian President Vladimir Putin pulling no punches on his intent. The new avant-garde missile system is invincible against today's and future air and missile defense systems of the potential enemy. It's capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. It flies up to 20 times faster than the speed of sound. It can adjust altitude and direction to avoid detection. Putin says it's invincible. Russia first touted their hypersonic missile in March with an animation showing warheads flying towards Florida. A new inter intercontinental ballistic missile called the Satan II, which can carry up to 26 independently targeted warheads, re-entry vehicles, if you will, 10 of them of a large size. Next total solar eclipse visible from the United States will take place on April 8th, 2024. The paths of the 2017 eclipse and the 2024 eclipse will intersect at Carbondale, Illinois. The reborn Phoenix missile. Below, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the North Country. They shall set themselves in array against her. From thence, she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. The current version of the Phoenix missile. Tango. What's going on right now? The Melka. Tango. Six. One seven. One seven. We're told not to talk about it. We did not talk about it. To anyone. As a strategic air command launch controller, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Salas was one of the men responsible for the deployment of nuclear Minuteman missiles. Three, two, one, key turn. These missiles were to be launched as a counterattack in the event of nuclear war. On March 16, 1967, 
Lieutenant Colonel Salas was on duty when he was contacted by his top side guard, stating that there was an unidentified object above the missile site. Salas ordered the guard to observe and report back on any further development. Then he called back within a few minutes and was very frightened. I could tell by his voice he was extremely agitated. Um, he said there was an object hovering outside the front door, a reddish-orange, oval-shaped object, and uh, it just hung there quietly. I went and woke up my commander and uh, told him about the two phone calls. Uh, and as I was telling him about the phone calls, our missiles went into no-go condition, one after the other. Well, we lost nearly 20 uh, missiles that morning. After speaking with his commander, Salas again contacted the topside guard. The guard said that uh, the UFO had vanished, basically just took off at high speed. It was no longer there. These uh, missiles are controlled individually. So if, if something did happen within the system, the electrical system, let's say, or the uh, command and control system for one missile, one launch facility, it would not affect the others. And in addition, these missiles are separated by miles. So all these things point to the fact that um, somehow this object was able to uh, disable these missiles. Though we know the fallen ones are behind much of the so-called UFO phenomenon, the Bible also describes similar vehicles used by God's holy messengers. For example, the chariots of Elijah and Ezekiel's will, a will inside a will. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a beryl, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Later that day, Salas was ordered to report to the Air Force Office of Special Investigations for debriefing by two OSI officers. And so after we gave him our little debrief, um, the first thing the Air OSI guy did is stand up and said, you need to sign these documents not to disclose any of this to anyone ever. And um, we signed, and basically that was it. They, neither one of them asked too many more questions and we were escorted out. This preliminary report, dated the 24th of March, 1967, states that between the hours of 2100 and 0400 Mountain Standard Time, numerous reports were received by Malmstrom Air Force Base agencies of UFO sightings in the Great Falls, Montana area. Another formally classified secret Air Force telex states that the fact that no apparent reason for the loss of 10 missiles can be readily identified is cause for grave concern to this headquarters. If unidentified flying objects are capable of disabling our most powerful weapon systems, then understandably the military would not want to reveal any information exposing its vulnerability. This is confirmed in a letter from the Department of the U.S. Air Force which states, as regards this subject matter, mere existence or non-existence is currently and properly classified per executive order and exempt from mandatory disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. And there is a Las Vegas guy making an extraordinary claim about extraterrestrials. So we sent Action News reporter Mike Delastrito to check it out. Mike? All right, guys, just listen up here. This guy says the Old Testament written in Hebrew taught him how to summon UFOs. All right, he says he can also do this on command, and he adds he's been doing it for 25 years, keeping all of it secret until now. These beings are here. They are here. They're just sitting right up there. We met up with Seer of Yahweh at Doolittle Park off Lake Mead. We picked the day, we picked the time, and we picked the location. Everyone's going to think you're absolutely nuts. Well, I thought I was absolutely nuts. Until, he says, he saw UFOs. Over the years, 1,500 of them. Can we make it uh, 1,501 today? What do you think? I'll try it. He says the voice in his head told him to go public now. So we took him up on his offer, and we scanned the skies. Nothing but a few clouds. When the prophet started praying for a sighting, I wasn't exactly convinced. I pray, oh Yahweh, that you sent a sighting so that they know that I am not mentally ill. I am not a false prophet. 
like those who seek to kill me say I am. I see something straight up. Oh, brother, look at it, there it is. You can barely see it, a white speck. Then another sighting. There it is, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Photojournalist Jonathan Hawkins locks in on it. Let's take a closer look here. It's an orange sphere that appeared out of nowhere. I call the boss with an unexpected change in my story. I'm I can see it clear as day. In fact, it's bright. I can't believe this. It's, it's moving pretty fast. It's going to Nellis Air Force Base. It wants to be seen. We called Nellis to see what these things might be. Guess what? They didn't call us back. But this thing started coming back toward us. Yeah. It's coming toward us now, I think. See, it's coming up toward us. Whoa, man! Oh, hallelujah! Then, a few seconds later, it disappeared. It's going back up in space. Prophet Yahweh isn't concerned. He says it'll be back. And I'm still not quite sure what those things were. Now, if I didn't see this for myself, I probably would have just laughed this whole thing off. Prophet Yahweh says, though, this is just the beginning. He says we're going to see a lot more of these things. This planet is being visited by beings from another world who, for whatever reason, have taken an interest in the nuclear arms race, which began at the end of World War II. I've been sent here to give y'all my truth, even at the risk of my own life, even at the risk of my own success, my own career. I've been sent here to give y'all the truth. These are the first words you hear on Kanye West's runaway, quote. You may think you peeped the scene. You haven't. The real one is far too mean. The watered down one, the one you know, was made up centuries ago. They made it sound all whack and corny. Yes, it's awful, blasted boring, twisted fiction, sick addiction, will gather round children, zip it, listen. In this critically acclaimed Kanye West video, Runaway, Kanye West encounters a mysterious feathered woman who fell from the sky. This woman is a phoenix and an allegory for the great horror Babylon. Presidential decrees cascading from President Trump's pen. A border wall with Mexico, another decree cutting the Trans-Pacific Partnership adrift. The other 11 member nations and the rest of the world now figuring out what it means for them. Who offers Mr. West fame and fortune, but at a cost. Now he cannot take a seat at the banquet table with the saints because of his relationship with his beastly harlot who is destined for destruction. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Macron's calling for a new European army, pan-European army, to defend against Russia, China, and America? They wanted to build a European army, and they've always seen America as the enemy, because America is bigger and richer and stronger, and they're jealous. He wants to build a United States of Europe. Mr. President, what did you mean by calm before the storm yesterday? You'll find out. The comment especially ominous is... Below, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the North Country. They shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. I believe Kanye West created this video to warn the public... There are 13 stars above the eagle's head, 13 stripes in the shield, 13 leaves on the olive branch, 13 arrows in the eagle's talon, and then 13 letters in the phrase E Pluribus Unum, which makes for two points on either side of the eagle's head, for the six points total of the hexagram. The reborn Phoenix missile, the aim 50 And comparing Donald Trump to King Cyrus, the biblical king who's credited with allowing Jews to return to Jerusalem from exile in the Babylonian empire. I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. You'll find out. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. The current version of the Phoenix I find it interesting that George Washington, Harding, Eisenhower, Carter, 
and the younger Bush all chose to be sworn into the office of the President with a hand on this Masonic Bible dating from 1770. There's the Freemason insignia on the front. And I tell you that this one offers Masonic helps. And again, it's an Oxford edition. Um, the opening, and this is something I really wanted to see in person, but they do feature Egyptian gods and goddesses. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. The works of William Shakespeare were actually produced by this man, the philosopher and politician Sir Francis Bacon. When one follows the Rosicrucian trail, John Dee was a very, very key influence in the historical Rosicrucians, and some say even the, you know, the founder of it, the first president of it. But at some point, the, the presidency was given over to Francis Bacon. And he was in charge of the Rosicrucians, not just in England, but it spread right through Europe. Dr. John Dee, passing the lamp of esoteric knowledge and wisdom to his successor, Francis Bacon. Yes, Dr. John Dee did pass the torch to Sir Francis Bacon. He also passed him the occult knowledge he attained from channeling, along with the manuscripts containing his so-called Enochian language that was dictated to him through demons straight from the infernal realms of hell. And guess what Sir Francis Bacon did with this new language he inherited? Bacon's desire to transform the world through knowledge. But he recognized that the key to obtaining knowledge was in a people's ability to communicate. As such, Bacon worked to reform the English language in ways never before realized. In England at that time, the English was dreadful. It was garbled with all kinds of different dialects, because if you think about it, England was made up of the Saxons, the Danes, the Gauls who had invaded, they were the Frenchmen, and they had a whole mixture of languages. So very often one Englishman could not communicate with another. It was here that Bacon formed the beginnings of his own literary society a secret group known as the Knights of the Helmet. They derived the roots of new English words, which they invented and put out. These new words were put out through a variety of literary works, books and poems and plays of the theater. Bacon's circle of writers and poets were largely responsible for the explosion of English literature during the Elizabethan era. In addition, Bacon was dedicated to bringing the sacred knowledge of the ancient world to English-speaking people, knowledge otherwise kept hidden by the barriers of language. But Bacon's purpose and that of his literary society was to prepare the people of the old world to colonize the land of the new. As the term colonization scheme suggests, the launching of Bacon's plan for America was not by chance, but by design. So in other words, the very English language we speak today is riddled with curses, spells, and incantations designed to keep us in spiritual bondage. Take for example Kanye West. The same man who made the song Jesus Walks now seems to be under intense spiritual attack surrounded by witchcraft and sorcery. Though Kanye West has no doubt given into the seductive spirit of New Egypt, i.e. Mystery Babylon, he has still managed to forewarn us about the fiery future of the American Phoenix. Most of the big Hollywood producers were evacuating to New Zealand or Tasmania. This country was founded by real Rosicrucians. You see, they're obsessed with blood. Until the earth appears to us like an immense sea of blood. DC officials flock to doomsday camps. What do they know that we don't know? The establishment is digging into armored bunkers. They're setting the plans in motion now. They're buying the bunkers. They're filling them with food. They're hiring the guards. The nature of the Great Seal is so mysterious that some believe that it came from a supernatural force. The Great Seal was given to Thomas Jefferson by a mysterious cloaked figure. Democracy, liberty, and justice. Who will survive in America?
swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great sweet multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of many thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Praise your holy name. God is a healer. I don't doubt him. I know who God is. He prepared something better for us, something that could change our hearts. It took the very blood of God's Son himself Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't tell me that the God we serve cannot bring lives back because me and my sister just witnessed it. God is awesome. He does miracles. And I'm here to tell somebody today, somebody today, that God can do the impossible. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou Most High. Thank you, Lord. God sent an angel to pretty much save my life, you know. After I went grocery shopping, as I was leaving the parking lot, I was at the stop sign waiting for other cars to come ahead of me. So I see the lady just speeding past the red light as I was going, and she was going to hit me. But as I was going, all of a sudden, I see something come from the sky, stop about five feet from the vehicle that was about to hit me. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We were in Sam's and this man was, was crying out, somebody help me. Somebody help me. And immediately I walked over and his wife was slumped over in the seat out, turning cold. She was getting cold and her face was blue. And all of a sudden I just see that that angel inside that cloud. There was a man inside the cloud. And he stopped it. I seen his sash. I seen his boots. He was floating. I even looked for like seven to ten seconds as he was flying in the air, leaving. God sent a holy angel. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. To bring us to the place that we are today. In the name of Jesus. And I looked at her and I said these words. God, if I don't know nothing else, I know how to pray. And I know what your word says. Your word says you are a healer. So I wrapped my arms around her. Yes, God. And I begin to pray for this woman. And I begin to call on God. And I told God and I spoke what his word says. And I said, God, she will live and not die. She will live and not die. And you will show signs and wonders. You are a miracle worker, God, and you're going to show yourself mighty today. Immediately, immediately, this woman opened her eyes, and the first thing came out of her mouth was, thank you, Jesus. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Hallelujah. And his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Yes. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And he saith unto me, These are the true saints of God. 
blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is worthy of all praise. Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shittah tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine, and the box tree together, that they may see, and know, and consider, and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. This sacrifice didn't come cheap. Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Our Heavenly Father is preparing the wilderness for us. When the time comes, we hope to see you there. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He made a covenant with us, an agreement that he didn't need to give. And this tells me that God was reaching out to all sorts of people. Thank you for watching False Camera Action. Before you go anywhere, don't forget to click subscribe.